achieve. And now here he is, new weapon to fight Zika, the mosquito. When it comes to killing humans, no other animal even comes close. Bill Gates, whose foundation fights disease globally, has written. So hiding in plain view, and then we have Zika virus, ATCCR, VR84, owned by the Rockefeller Foundation, blood from experimental forests, sentinel rhesus monkeys, Uganda, 1947, and now it pops up in Latin America, and tell us what it supposedly does, Dr. Group, you've got the floor. We know how bad GMO crops are, uh, but GMO animals, we know about transhumanism, we know about all the experimentation with genetic codes being spliced into animals. Mosquitoes are a vector, it's just like a needle, it's just like a vaccine. So all of the people that out there saying, well, I don't wanna be vaccinated anymore, well, guess what? You're gonna have genetically modified mosquitoes running around and flying around everywhere. And, and he admits that's his plan. You. Make you, in fact, he's the one pioneering uh, vaccines in, in fruit and vegetables where it's, it grows pharmacologically in the fruit. You don't have a choice. He's all about making you take it. And I guess yeah. they're making us take Zika. I think with the Zika virus, it's, well, number one, in, te in Trexron's stock, has gone up the genetically modified uh, mosquito production company and oh isn't that just cute and and, uh, and now all of a sudden they said today that there's an Indian corporation that has two vaccines so with this world's uh, first Zika virus vaccine made in India claim scientists Bill and Melinda Gates funding it thank God they love us also you have to look at what's going on in Brazil why is all why are all these mosquitoes being released in Brazil. Well, you have the Olympics in Brazil, Summer Olympics in 2016. You're going to have representatives and, and people, contestants, athletes, fans from every country in the world in one central location. And that's where they're releasing this virus. So it's a perfect vector to spread this disease all over. Now they say it can be- But even better, then everybody's gotta have the vaccine when you quote, get your shots to go to Brazil, and then who knows what'll be in the Bill and Melinda Gates developed Zika vaccine. As a matter of fact, just today, some, the, they confirmed somebody in Texas uh, got the Zika virus from sexually transmitted, and now they're saying through saliva as well. So the, so the solution to that for everybody listening is just keep your immune system strong. You know, Get lots of sleep, don't stress out. Take vitamin C, take some zinc, by the way, which is an anthroplex. You know, keep all, keep your body cleansed, keep your self healing mechanisms strong. There's a lot of different herbs out there oregano oil, iodine. There's silver. They also admit that one flu shot cuts your immune system by 50% for at least a year. You guys have the exclusive for, which is a product called Deep Cleanse. And why I'm so excited about it is it's a unique formula, almost like the iodine crystals. We have two unique products that nobody in the world has. One of the most amazing ingredients in the world, and it's called Shilajit. And it's actually known as blood of the mountain or rock sweat because thousands of years ago, as a matter of fact, this ingredient was only given to the elite of the elite. Thousands of years ago, up in the Himalayan mountains and in Tibet. And we wanted to put this in, in stuff for, for a couple years, but we couldn't get an organic form. Right. I mean, so I, let's explain. I mean, we, this stuff's so good, we couldn't put it out for years. Right. So I had to actually, it's kind of like the iodine crystals, finding a source deep in the earth that we could get the cleanest source available. But in Tibet and in Nepal and in the Himalayan mountains, Thousands of years ago, they found, they watched these monkeys. And during the summer months, the monkeys would go up into the mountains. Now you're being racist against monkeys. And they would pick this black substance from the mountains. And so uh, in Russia, they actually, it, it, it grows in Russia in the mountains and in the Himalayas and only in the summer. And Chilajit is actually the decomposition of seven, up to 7,000 different medicinal herbs. So it decomposes, all these different herbs decompose in the Himalayan mountains and the volcanic soil up there. And what happens in the summertime- So it's almost like an oil up. from- Yes, it's high in fulvic acid, it's high in humic acid. Because they're always claiming out. oil is really from decomposed animals and plants. There is some oil that is based from fossils, but most of it's really abiotic. But so, so this is a true fossil uh, source. I mean, explain it to me. 
It is, uh, it's really the decomposition, like I said, of over 7,000 different medicinal herbs and plants. And it, and with the rocks and the pressure deep in the mountains, it freezes and, and during the summertime and the pressures build it up. It oozes out. It oozes out. So it literally oozes out of the mountain. It's like rock sap. It's like rock sap. It's black and it's highly nutritious. Uh, even in the 1980s when the Olympic athletes in Russia were accused of being on steroids, they found out that they were actually been given shalajit because it, it works as an anabolic as well and it builds muscles. It's a big dose in there. The second big main ingredient in there is a volcanic zeolite concentrate. And this, what this formula is designed to do, the shilajit and the zeolites have a real strong negative charge. All the metals and chemicals and PCBs and VOCs have positive charges. So these go in, they grab it, and then they safely eliminate it through the body so you can become healthy. I mean, the, this is an amazing formula. I wish I actually had it, but because this was an exclusive InfoWars Life product, you're the only one in the world that has this formula now. And, uh, you know, there is going to be a limited supply available when you sell out because you can only harvest this once a year. How do people take it? How is it recommended that this be done? Just a daily, daily dose? Yeah, daily dose. Uh, the instructions are on the label. You know, of course, I, I kind of modify it for each individual. It depends on what your lifestyle is. I mean, the, honestly, the best thing to do is for you to avoid all these chemicals and toxins in your environment and try to identify them and start slowly reducing them. But personally, I, I'm going to probably take it every day, every other day, and I'll probably go with about a dropper full to maybe two dropper fulls. Uh, and I, and I, I don't expose myself to any chemicals. InfoWarsLife.com. Please also support our local AM and FM affiliates, support their local sponsors, or become a sponsor and spread the word. Because these aren't just great products. This is how we fund this independent operation. We're not taxpayer funded like MSNBC or NPR, and neither is your local station. So support them, folks. This is a war. <laughs> Recently, a woman in Houston was sentenced to life in prison for sex trafficking. A very harsh reminder that modern-day slavery is still alive and well, and many people think of these things as something that happened overseas or something such as slavery being extinct, but it is happening, and it is happening right here in the United States of America. And to talk about this, we have a professor from the University of Nebraska, Triani Tidball. So you're a professor at the University of Nebraska. Can you tell us what got you first involved in combating human trafficking? Well, before I came to teach at the University of Nebraska, I had been living in Sri Lanka, which is where home is for me. Um, I was born in Sri Lanka and raised there, and I came here to go to school. So I never knew at that time growing up that uh, there was human trafficking in Sri Lanka and all forms of trafficking until 2008, let's see, 2000 was when um, George Bush, the president, coined that name human trafficking to cover everything from child prostitution to child labor to unsafe migration of women and organ trafficking and child soldiers and all those things. And we had them all in Sri Lanka. So, you know, I had seen all of it and uh, growing up there I had been on my own trying to do some things to help people out. So I guess it wasn't a formal, you know, here I go to start working on trafficking. Yeah, so it wasn't just one day, um, you know, you woke up and you realized this. It was a, a slow, gradual process that this came to your attention. Yeah, because you see it in front of you and then you realize it's not right, you know? Yes. So when you're talking about the way you came about to realizing this, uh, what are some warning signs? You know, if people are watching this video and they're looking for warning signs of human trafficking, what should they look for? I think the first thing is you've got to realize that children need to be children, that they have rights. They do not need to be sold. The foster care system in America is broken. Why is there such a system? It's because families are dysfunctional. Why are families dysfunctional? Because they're basically selfish. So. You know, if you have children, you've got to take care of them. You've got to look after them, make sure they're safe. And when people, due to some of their own issues, like maybe drug addiction or some other kinds of uh, issues, they start using their children to be able to continue their habits. And then the children run away. They're picked up by traffickers. So when you're asking for signs, I think if you see families that are not taking care of their children, then everyone's at risk. 
the families are at risk for selling their kids and the children are definitely at risk. In terms of child labor or labor trafficking, I mean, that's another whole area that's very you know, prevalent in America because a lot of people don't want to do the kinds of jobs they used to do, like meat packing factories or you know, roofing or whatever. And they try to find ways to get people to come and work for cheap things that American people don't want to do. So these, you know, promises are made, people come across borders. They are then once again used and abused. Then, you know, we are talking about illegal, legal, undocumented, documented. I mean, what what is it? People, it's all a supply demand model. If there is no demand, nobody's going to come across the border to work. If there's no demand, nobody's going to buy children for sex or even women for sex. So um, I guess that's the issue that I see. Yes, and you touched on something there. It's larger than just sex trafficking because we hear about things uh, like sweatshops, sweatshops across the seas and people think it's very prevalent over there. But what you're saying that uh, we could have a similar type of situation going on right here in the United States. Right, right. Oh, there definitely is. America is a huge uh, demand, uh, you know, a demand country for all these things that they want. They want uh, they want sex with children. So as long as they want that, children are at risk of being, you know, either taken and sold or they're running away and, they're, you know, sold. Any of those things can happen. Now, I know it's a very broad topic, but let's say, is there any particular area or any type of situation that you would find a child trafficking in? Or is there a particular area of the country or a type of event where these things happen? Okay, well, I think every city, I mean, across America, every single year, the Department of Justice says there's between 200,000 and 300,000 children between 12 and 14 taken into sex trafficking. Now, we're not talking about some refugee kids coming across the border. That's a different number, a different statistic. We are talking about that little girl next door. We're talking about just the regular American girl between 12 and 14 is at risk. So this is right across the whole country. I mean, I'm just finishing up a research study of some girls in Nebraska that got traffic. It can be in cities, it can be in rural areas. As long as, you know, men want to buy, girls are going to be available. And if somebody suspects trafficking, you said it could be your next door neighbor, you know, the girl down the street, you know, what should somebody do if they think something is amiss with the relationship between the child and the uh, caretaker? Well, um, maybe you would talk to the girl if you can. Uh, very often they're scared to speak, but I think if you can befriend her and find out what's going on and then maybe you might want to. The thing is that the most girls who are trafficked, they don't trust law enforcement. Sometimes law enforcement in certain states and cities are not trained because whenever they see a girl that's been um, sold for sex, they see her as a prostitute rather than a prostituted person. And uh, very often she does not get the, you know, there's so much stigma. She's afraid to tell police. But, you know, FBI is really good to help you if the child is under 18. But if the child is just turned 18, then suddenly this victim becomes a criminal because we criminalize prostitution in America and we don't ever look at it as somebody being prostituted versus a prostitute. You know, these are 95 percent of the prostitute, uh, the people that we call prostitutes are prostituted people. They are under a pimp. They don't want to do what they're doing. They are forced. Absolutely. Now, I just, in your personal opinion, uh, I hear people talk about the legalization of prostitution. Would you think that a legalization of prostitution would help alleviate the problem at all? No, it'll make it much worse. It'll, main, it'll make it perfectly fine for people then to buy girls who have been uh, taken, who are being forced into it. A pimp can go scot-free and the uh, Johns, or the, I hate to use the word John, by the way, that's a nice word that has been created by the men who buy. Because I don't know about you, but my, you know, we have a lot of Johns in our family, my father-in-law, my brother-in-law, his children. So this, man, this name John has been taken to make it soft. 
and then the girls are called Natasha's to make them exotic. So that's really, you know, very unfair. Anyway, men who buy, I call them buyers, um, they're very 